It's a real pleasure for me to join you this evening to introduce uh, a man who has dedicated his life to public service. Ambassador Oakley joined the U.S. Foreign Service in 1957, and over the past three decades, he has served in numerous foreign posts in what I think we would all consider some of the most troubled spots in the world. He served as ambassador in Somalia, in Zaire, and in Pakistan. And more recently, as most of us know, he was appointed as special envoy to Somalia under both Presidents Clinton and Bush. He's also spent some time over the past 30 years in the United States where he's been at the U.S. mission to the U.N. with the National Security Council and as the director of uh, State Department's Office on Combating Terrorism. When I first met him, which was back in the early 80s, he was serving as ambassador in Zaire and I was just passing through Kinshasa to look at our operations. He had recently arrived and we had a very friendly and cordial but minimal uh, contact. But in taking over here at CRS, I find that uh, our contact with uh, Ambassador Oakley over the years has been quite profound and, and very strong. We had one of our staff in Beirut who was taken hostage, Father Martin Jenko. And Ambassador Oakley at that time was very instrumental in supportive in, in helping us uh, get him released. During Ambassador Oakley's time in Somalia, he was greatly respected by that community that I'm deeply involved in, the American Private Voluntary Agency. But also, he earned the respect of all the different factional groups. I remember talking to people in Belatwain and Baidoa who talked about Ambassador Oakley with great, great elan. The Klan leaders, and even what's oftentimes I find in the international area the most difficult people to group of people to earn respect from those who are critical of American foreign policy. He was well known, and I think the name Oakley, in a way, became uh, a representative of kind of tough, honest diplomacy. Tough, honest diplomacy, sometimes with the toughest of characters, as we found in, in Somalia. Let me just go back a little bit, uh, and I won't take long, to 1992-93, when Ambassador Oakley took over. At that time, I just happened to be based in Nairobi, and my portfolio included operations in Somalia. The American troops arrived in December, and I think December 6th, and on December 16th, my, my headquarters said, go down to Mogadishu and arrange for the visit of Cardinal Roger Mahoney of Los Angeles, because the troops who were there were from Camp Pendleton. So I headed down to uh, Mogadishu, stopped in at the airport at the Military Visitors Center. I was their first visitor, and they welcomed me with open arms. They hadn't put the whiteboards up yet, but they had written Whitney Houston as the only visitor other than uh, Cardinal Mahoney. So the fact that I was there, was they, they were kind of enthusiastic. And the colonel who was in charge wouldn't hear that I would take a taxi because I said to him I wanted to go up and see the ambassador next to inform him that uh, Cardinal Mahoney was coming for Christmas. He wouldn't hear about me taking a taxi, although I got there in a taxi. He said, no, no, I'll give you a Humvee and an escort and we'll take you up. So I jumped into the front Humvee with the young guys in the back with all their their get up and go in the back Humvee. And off we set out for to find Ambassador Oakley's residence. They had the maps, they were assured it was about a mile and a half away. You can imagine, we got lost. <laughs> I said, I think this is the street. They said, no, 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 uh, this isn't it. We turned down, and we pulled onto a sandy kind of road, and there's two armored personnel carriers with a whole bunch of UN Pakistani blue-helmeted troops sitting on the armored personnel carriers. There's a big wall, and a whole bunch of people milling outside the wall. We pulled up. I said, I'll get out and check. The lieutenant with me said, no way, no way. He got out, banged us his rifle on the on the gate and I could hear I don't know exactly what the term for it is the rifles go click 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 
I mean, they were nervous that two American Humvees pulled into this gate. We were in the wrong place. We were at the compound of General Hadid. <laughs> and so as I turned around, trying to make a very quick exit because there is a lot of tension here with two American Humvee vehicles pulling in on the Pakistani troops with the Somalis with the, the guns as well. I wanted a quick exit out of there. And I turn around and a microphone is shoved in my face and a guy says, I'm Morton Dean. Who are you? <laughs> I said, I am nobody. <laughs> and we got out of there, went up the street and actually got to the ambassador's residence. But I think uh, you know, in a way, I'd like to believe that, that Catholic Relief Services is pretty well known, uh, particularly the, to correspondents like uh, Morton Dean, but I think it's always good at certain times to have a degree of anonymity, <laughs> particularly when you're visiting General Adid's headquarters with American troops. Our guest this evening does not always have that uh, luxury of anonymity. His commitment to peace and reconciliation, which continues... Uh, even after his retirement, he's now associated with the Institute of National Strategic Studies of the National Defense University. His commitment, his name, is recognized worldwide. And it's a great pleasure for me this evening to introduce a man I have long admired, Ambassador Oakley. And Frank, thank you, thank all of you. I want to start off with a matching Somalia story about uh, the Catholic Relief Service. And thank you <clears throat> to make sure that we get this thing right. All right. We'll get them to turn it up. Okay. The first major move inland was to Baidoa, which was the sort of the center of the starvation and mass death, uh, something that you all saw on television, all of us did uh, day after day. And I arrived and we had developed this practice, uh, and it really was something that happened on the ground. Uh, there was very, very little pre-planning to the operation in Somalia. Maybe that's why it went so well during the earlier period. <laughs> they just sort of picked the people who they thought could do the job and said, go out there and do it. And uh, we had known each other well enough, the Marine generals and I, and had enough common experiences that we sort of figured out what ought to be done, what what, what, what to avoid doing. We'll talk about that later on, but I had gone to a humanitarian conference in Addis where all the non-governmental organizations were represented, all the UN agencies, uh, and there were a number of Somali leaders there, and I thought this would be a sensible way to sort of introduce myself back into the region and get to know some of the people personally. This was the 1st of December, I guess, or the 2nd of December. And when the conference ended, uh, I had sort of reacquainted myself with the region and with a lot of the Somalis, and I realized that if I went back to the United States, uh, by the time I could return to the region, the Marines would have landed and much of the action would be well underway. So I decided I would go to Modijo first. And there was some our ambassador in Kenya was terribly disconcerted. He said, well, you can't do that, it's too dangerous. And I laughed, I said, uh, I'm in charge of where I'm going. If you don't like it, uh, call Washington. And they called back and said, well, they said that you can do whatever you want to do. Uh, so I went. And it turned out to be the right thing to do because by talking to our friend Adid, Ken, and some of the others, I was able to calm them down and make them realize Two things. Number one, they sort of believed me when I said we're not coming to colonize because they knew my reputation, which is one of always being frank. I spent much of my earlier tour there from 82 to 84 fighting with Siad Bari. 
Uh, and they knew that, even though we had a big program and some people accused us of total support for Siad Barre, uh, not the case, and they knew it. They're very, very good judges of character. Uh, so I was very frank with them. I said, they're going to be a lot of people coming ashore. They have tremendous firepower. These are the same people and the same commanders and the same uh, <clears throat> units, some of the same weapons that uh, did the job over in Kuwait and Iraq. Therefore, you understand what happens if they're obliged to get into a conflict. But that's not the purpose of it. The purpose of it is to bring relief, to restore hope to this country. And we don't intend to colonize. We don't intend to tell you what to do. We want to help you work out your own problems. So why don't we do this the easy way? And that worked. And I was glad to see it. I was still able to communicate. The next step was Baidoa, the middle of the real horror story. And I got to the airport, and I went alone. The Marines were coming the next day. And big escort uh, with armed men and these wonderful so-called technical vehicles and all this stuff uh, from the airport into town. And I remember going to the compound of the uh, <coughs> International Medical Corps and uh, people running around to some of the nurses screaming, oh, we're saved, we're saved, because they've been under tremendous tension. And they were afraid that they were going to be attacked uh, in anticipation. And before the arrival of the Marines, they were afraid that uh, they would all be looted and who knows what else. But uh, that didn't happen. And even I met with all the local leadership, the religious leaders, the clan leaders, the so-called political leaders, uh, the militia leaders, and talked it over with them and said, look, this is your time now. Peace is being restored. We want you to make something out of it. We want you to set up your own institutions, whatever you want. But we need to have something with which we can relate uh, so we can work with you, uh, much better you tell us what you want to have done as we begin to provide relief and begin to do something to rehabilitate this, uh, this country. But we'd like to work with you. Also on security, I'll tell you the same thing I told Adid and Ali Mahdi and the others in Mogadishu. If we could sit down and talk it over together and reach some understandings, then we can avoid accidents. And the accidents are going to be very, very unhappy for you all, uh, the militia. Uh, not for us, because we're very heavily armed. And therefore, we would like to avoid this sort of problem. And so they said, all right. Uh, but they had everybody there. And a deeds man spoke up and said, oh, well, I'm telling everybody what to do. And I said, no, I don't really think that makes much sense. Uh, here we have uh, a representative of the local women's group. Uh, we have religious leaders. We've got... Uh, uh, clan leaders, and uh, we even have people from other factions. And uh, although it is true that Adid put a man in here as governor uh, when he was in charge militarily, no one's in charge militarily anymore. That period is over. So I think that all of you need to get together and work out some sort of approach. And then the sheikh, uh, old, old man with a hinted beard, spoke up and said, I'm very worried. I said, what, what worries you? He said, I'm afraid that Islam is going to be swamped. He said, the country is so weak right now, and uh, we see you all coming in with all this force and all this uh, power. And uh, he looked around, and he sort of, I could see, he was staring at the representative of the Catholic Relief Services, who was in this small meeting with us. And I laughed, and I said, no one is here, including my friend from the Catholic Relief Service, to impose anything upon you. That means political, religious, you name it. That's not our purpose. Furthermore, the United States has all possible religions. We have great respect for all religions. We have them all in our country, and we learn to respect them abroad. We have a number of countries with which we work very, very closely that are Muslim. I've served in several Muslim countries. And you'll see, uh, when our troops arrive tomorrow, that we have the sort of respect. Uh, and so he seemed to be reassured, and I went back to the airport with no escort whatsoever. I wanted to make it a point of honor. I said, coming in here, 
Okay, but going back, we're not having any weapons because uh, I trust you, and I'm sure that you all will look after me. <clears throat> and that's the best protection you could have. With, we're fortunate because when I got back to Mogadishu, I was able to scramble around and find two Marines who were Lebanese Americans. And so uh, the first Marines that arrived in Baidoa the next day were Muslims. And that made a big impression upon the Sheikh. And uh, within a week, the Catholic Relief Service was helping him rebuild destroyed mosques, which made an even bigger impression upon everybody. And that's the way we tried to proceed. Uh, they set up something akin to a New England town meeting in order to sort of administer their affairs since they no longer were under a dictatorial regime, whether it be Siad Barre or Adid or anybody else. And uh, at one point, the town council, talking to this Marine colonel, said, over there is a compound full of bandits. And they've been raping and pillaging even after you got here. They sneak out at night and go through the countryside of these vehicles and do all sorts of terrible things. And we want you to uh, take care of them. And so he said, they I think probably about three times as many people uh, at that particular town meeting as are here this afternoon. And so the Marine Colonel said, now, is that unanimous? And everyone, including our deeds representatives, said, yes, yes, uh, these are terrible people. Uh, they must be removed. So he sent a squad of men over there with their weapons, and they knocked on the door politely and said, are you coming out or are we coming in? And uh, they all came out and surrendered a huge, huge uh, horde of weapons, heavy weapons, light weapons, all sorts of things, everything you can imagine, cannons, machine guns, rockets. Uh, uh, and they had indeed been up to no good. And so all the weapons were taken. The next day, Adid sent his lieutenant up this sandy road that you were talking about, Ken, to see me and said, uh, Adid wonders if he could get the weapons back. I said, which weapons? He said, uh, the ones that were confiscated up in Baidoa. I said, uh, but those were bandits. And I said, uh, Adid's representatives said they were bandits and said that uh, the weapons should be taken away. He said, yes, yes, but in fact, they were Adid's people, and Adid wants to know if he could get the weapons back. <laughs> and I laughed, and I said, the fellow name was Osman Otto, a great businessman. Uh, and who actually turned out to be very, very helpful to us uh, because he understood the way Adid thought, and he was a was local Caterpillar representative. He also understood how Americans thought, and so he was invaluable. Some people thought that he was the devil. In fact, he was very, very important uh, force for moderation. And I said, no way. He'd laugh. He said, I knew that was going to be the answer, but Adid told me I had to try. <laughs> But it was a funny, funny country and a tricky one, uh, but we tried to approach it <clears throat> with minimal uh, confrontation. We had one basic rule, that is, decisions are not going to be made at gunpoint. Aside from that, we said to the Somalis, you work it out. You have your own way of solving disputes. That I know. If I tried to solve them, I would certainly get it wrong. Furthermore, you all would soon have me bogged down in all of your internal matters, and it would be like Gulliver the Lilliputians. Uh, I'd be unable to do anything because I'd be totally bogged down in your internal disputes. I said, so if you have an argument with somebody, uh, and this happened several times, I said, <clears throat> okay, you have a complaint, be back in my office at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, I'd have the other man there. I said, now you two sit down and talk it through, and when you've reached some agreement, that's fine. Uh, take as long as you want. <clears throat> But Americans have a tendency to see the world through our own eyes. We have a tendency to assume we can solve everybody else's problems. I remember that from my first posting abroad in Khartoum in 1958, wondering how it is that Americans are so self-assured when we go abroad that we just tell other people exactly what to do and this is going to solve all their problems. And yet here at home, we seem to have a heck of a time solving our own problems, and we're very, very, and we're very, very critical of ourselves. Uh, therefore, uh, how is it that we sort of magically are one thing abroad and another thing at home? And we give the impression abroad that everything in this country is perfect, and until people get here, they sort of think that way too. Uh, but we tried to avoid these problems. Uh, the Marine generals and I, for example, had served in Vietnam, and we'd served in Lebanon. And we said, we're going to avoid taking sides, even accidentally, in somebody else's civil war. 
because that happened in Lebanon in 1983, and the Marine barracks got blown up, and uh, the U.S. policy was blown up, and the whole uh, thing was a real tragedy. And so we're not going to do that. Unpleasant as it may be, or individuals may be, or groups may be, uh, we're going to find a way to deal with all of them on an equal basis. Anyone who seriously threatens us, There'll be a quick response, and that happened on a few occasions, but only a few because they understood how quick and how decisive the response would be, and so they stopped trying. Uh, the U.S. forces were always alert, but always courteous. The rules of engagement, if you will, allowed them to shoot any time they felt threatened, but in fact they leaned very, very far backwards. And for every time that a Somali was shot uh, because he was seen or appeared to be threatening uh, an American soldier, or the other soldiers for that matter, uh, with a couple of exceptions, there were 50 occasions when that could have happened. And uh, so by leaning backwards, the Somalis understood, <clears throat> in contrast to what happened later on, that we had the power, but we had no intent to abuse them. And so they would get angry. That's the temperament of the Somalis. They're very fractious, very difficult people. And yet, when they were angry, they'd throw stones rather than shooting uh, mortars or machine guns or rocket-propelled grenades, and that was the level of violence that was tolerable. Uh, we would respond with pepper mace or tear gas or something of that kind. Uh, so the situation was never calm and peaceful, but it was manageable, and we managed to keep it that way. We also decided, because we'd had a common experience in Vietnam, that we were not going to take over somebody else's country and start running it as we had done in Vietnam, aside from the military aspect of the war, <clears throat> there was a very important but less noted civilian aspect in Vietnam where the United States, in fact, took over the government. And we had an American advisor behind every Vietnamese, military and civilian. And one of my tasks, as a matter of fact, with Phil Habib, uh, orders from Lyndon Johnson in the White House to Cabot Lodge in Saigon, and he knew better. But his instruction to us was, I was the President of the United States wants South Vietnam to become a democracy. And we looked at each other and said, now, what does this mean? And Lodge says, those are your orders. So Habib and I proceeded to make all the preparations for a constituent assembly, which was elected. <coughs> And after having been duly elected, uh, we turned over to them a draft constitution, which we had drawn up. And they duly fiddled with it a little bit and then ratified it. And uh, pretty soon they had elections and they had the two house uh, Congress and uh, an independent presidency and an independent judiciary. And it was all totally hollow because it was built and made in the United States. And only so long as we were there could it be sustained. And as soon as we left, it collapsed, uh, and that was part of the problem. We took over somebody else's country. We were running it our way uh, in the middle of their war, if you will. <clears throat> and we concluded we didn't want to do that. Now, this gets back to the second half of what happened in Somalia. And I'm the cautious approach, which is one that had been developed over really 12 years of Reagan Bush foreign policy and national security policy. Uh, they'd made mistakes, as I suggested, in Lebanon in 1983, a very situation similar to what happened in Somalia in 1993. Uh, but they'd learned from the mistakes. So here you had a new administration coming in that had no pri previous experience, or if they'd had it, it was so at least 12 years old, uh, very idealistic. Uh, and they said, well, things are going well in Somalia. So. It became the first test case for rebuilding failed states. And we began to rebuild it, we and the United Nations together, in our image. And then we decided, well, this group over here is obstructing what we want to have happen in Somalia. So we'll marginalize them. And Adid said, I'm the guy that got rid of Siad Barre. I am his logical, and so far as I'm concerned, his appointed by Allah's successor. And furthermore, I'm the strongest, roughest guy in the country, and no one is going to marginalize me in my own country, particularly not foreigners. And so I'll find a way to get back at you. And we ended up in exactly the same situation we've been in in Lebanon uh, 10 years earlier, where the belief that our superior firepower, 
our AC-130s and uh, Cobra gunships and uh, our high technology would enable us, as we thought it would in Lebanon and as we thought it might in uh, Vietnam, just to get what we wanted. Well, the 16-inch guns and the, carrier and the aircraft carriers did not avail in Lebanon because the people who ended up on the other side from us in the Civil War, once we took sides, found a way to blow up the Marine barracks. And the same thing happened ultimately in Somalia. It was most unfortunate, uh, but it was almost inevitable once we got ourselves into the middle of that mess. We in the United Nations together with a great deal of idealism and enthusiasm because this was the new world order. And the United Nations was going to be the instrument used to repair failed states, uh, to deal with the internal violence, which was becoming more and more acute. You all have seen it around the world. Uh, <clears throat> this is the way in which we're going to solve other people's problems. Well, it still is probably, well, let's not say, it is a very important means of dealing with the problems we have in the world today. Uh, we're not going to have nearly as much, if any, cross-border aggression. I think that uh, Saddam Hussein uh, may well have been the last. Uh, <clears throat> instead, you're going to find problems, as we've seen, around the world. Somalia, Rwanda, Liberia, Sierra Leone, uh, Mozambique, Angola. But then you have Tajikistan, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and the former Soviet Union. Uh, you've got uh, the former Yugoslavia. <clears throat> you still have problems in South Asia, in countries like Sri Lanka, Kashmir between Pakistan and India. But these are primarily internal problems, uh, not problems of external aggression. So how do you deal with them? Well, my belief is that one must deal with them cautiously that we have to understand the culture, the history, the political realities of the countries that one would like to help. We need to understand that one can only go so far that they have a responsibility that ultimately only they can solve these problems. We can help a little bit. Uh, we can certainly uh, deal with problems of famine. We can help them uh, Replow. We can help them reseed. We can help them uh, clean out their irrigation dishes. We can help them inoculate their cattle. And Somalia now is back to where it was five years ago, before the civil wars and the big drought began. Uh, the harvests are much better than they have been in five years. There's no more famine in the country. But what's also what there isn't is a nice, neat central government Western style. And by trying to bring this about, <clears throat> rather than allowing them to develop their own institutions from the bottom up, we inadvertently created a situation where those who had ambitions to be the top man had to fight because this train is moving and somebody has to be up there in the cab uh, running it. And so they fought to get in that cab, something that probably should not have happened if one had taken it much more slowly and moved at their pace rather than our pace and allowed them to work it out, it may take quite a while. Uh, but in many of these cases, unfortunately, there's only so much we can do. And I think that we have to be more careful. And I think that the administration is being more careful in measuring the limits of what is achievable, also in measuring something that's very important, the limits of what the American people and the American Congress will tolerate in terms of involvement, in terms of where we're going to put U.S. military force, where we're going to put uh, our money, where we're going to put our political resources. We can only go so far. And in a day, in today's world, which is quite confused, where are our vital interests? Uh, they're sometimes hard to find. So we have to think more carefully about what we're doing. And we need to have 
objectives that are more limited, therefore more easily achievable, and we have to make sure that when we set out to do something, this is we and the United Nations, if you will, uh, the world collectively, we've got the resources to do it. Now, Cambodia is an interesting situation where there was a very ambitious mandate from the United Nations Security Council. The United States was not involved, but there were 20,000 military and civilian personnel under the blue flag of the United Nations, and they began to implement an extremely ambitious mandate, which was really moving toward the one which they tried to implement in Somalia, virtual colonial administration, if you will, a trusteeship of another country. But in Cambodia, on the ground in Phnom Penh, the five permanent members of the Security Council had very good ambassadors. And back in the capitals, they were watching it very, very closely because this. And in addition to that, the United Nations had very good people on the ground. They looked at it and said, well, if we continue to go this route, we're going to end up in a confrontation and war with the Khmer Rouge. So let's back off. Let's settle for a much more modest objective of having elections, letting the local people organize them with us observing them, rather than our taking over the country and our organizing the elections to make sure they're absolutely free and fair. Uh, and lo and behold, the Khmer Rouge backed off. They didn't try to disrupt the elections outside of the area which they controlled, and there were no elections held there. That's one of the, the moderating elements in the reform of the United Nations mission for Cambodia was to say, let's not try to go into Khmer Rouge territory, because if we go in, we're going to have to fight our way in, and that means uh, an end to the whole operation. Let's hope that in time, uh, the people in their area will realize the benefits of the elections that are held elsewhere. And I think that over time that's going to work, but it's their time frame. It's not a perfect democracy in Cambodia, but Elizabeth Becker, whom I know quite well, has now gone out there and she wrote some, some of the first books that have been written about Cambodia, about how bad the situation was during the Khmer Rouge, and she's found, which shouldn't surprise me, that the situation is now much better if you look at it in terms of Cambodian history. Uh, there's always been a fair amount of violence and conflict, but it's calming down. And over time, I think it'll continue to calm down. They'll look at their neighbors. And just as the Vietnamese, five or six years ago, decided they wanted to go the private enterprise route and move away from tight authoritarian control and socialism, and they're now flourishing uh, because they saw what happened in the non-communist ASEAN states around them, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Philippines. Uh, and they saw what was happening in China, so they decided to take a different route. Uh, and Vietnam now is quite respectable politically and uh, economically and in other ways. So the same thing probably will happen in Cambodia over time because the example of the others uh, will, will, will be determining. But this is letting countries and regions work things out their way with a limited amount of assistance, uh, not going too far, not going too fast. And this is something we have to learn, I believe. <clears throat> I think that in a situation where our vital interests are not clearly at threat and where we have enough problems at home, we need to understand that there may not be an opportunity for a definitive solution. And agonizing as it is, and you hear from Warren Zimmerman, a good friend of mine and a superb diplomat uh, in three weeks, I think that the best one can do in Bosnia right now is containment. <clears throat> If it doesn't spread and Sarajevo doesn't start a third world war like it started the first world war, everyone will have achieved the absolutely essential minimal objective. Uh, there's a lot of work being done by non-governmental organizations, by international, by the ICRC, the Red Cross, uh, by UN agencies and by governments like the United States to alleviate the humanitarian problems. <clears throat> but the United Nations has never been strong enough to deal with the fundamental problems. 
there's been a lot of self-delusion that maybe we could. There's been a lot of political rhetoric. Uh, yes, uh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, but in fact, uh, it's never been on. And I think this is one of the problems is that, uh, <clears throat> as I've seen it, in the last three or four years, once the, curiously, uh, the Soviet veto disappeared in the Security Council, the Security Council has become very much like the General Assembly used to be and still is, a place where all sorts of resolutions and presidential statements are issued, which make those who issue them look good or feel good, but they're not intended, or at least uh, they're not seriously intended, to solve the problem. There have been 139 Security Council resolutions and presidential statements on the former Yugoslavia in the past uh, four years, and we've seen the result. Uh, there have been eight to ten times as many Security Council resolutions adopted every year in the past four years as there were every year up until 1989 when the uh, Berlin Wall fell and uh, the Soviets and the Americans stopped having at each other in the Security Council. This change toward cooperation rather than confrontation was illusory. And George Bush invented the term New World Order, uh, thinking that the cooperation between the five permanent members of the Security Council and most of the countries of the world in dealing with the threat from Iraq really did inaugurate a new era where the United Nations will be able to do what it was supposed to do when it was founded in 1945. But as I've suggested, in places like uh, Somalia and uh, probably in Bosnia, uh, one is overreached, uh, hoping that you could get more out of it than you really can. <clears throat> and the results of October the 3rd and 4th in Mogadishu, where Adid, having been, and his forces having been attacked on a number of occasions by Americans, and there was one notable occasion on the 12th of July when a deliberate attack by Cobra gunships belonging to the United States upon a compound where the top clan and <clears throat> faction leaders were meeting, killed 30 or 40 of them. Only after that were there direct attacks upon Americans from uh, Adid's people. We got caught up in things, but after that there were direct attacks because from then on it was war. And this contrasted to the situation we had earlier on that I've tried to describe. And eventually, as in 11 and 10 years earlier, we ended up paying a price. But the price has become so much stronger and so much more powerful, and I think uh, so much more serious because of the reverberations at home. And the administration had done a terrible job of preparing the American people and the American Congress for what was going on in Somalia. It had never been explained. The shift from a cooperative approach to sort of a coercive approach had not been explained. The reasons for this shift had not been explained. Uh, the fact that U.S. combat personnel were operating under U.S. command, not under U.N. command, not only had not been explained, it's not been explained to this day. Uh, Congress keeps saying, well, we can't have anything to do with the United Nations. Look, they got our people killed in Somalia. Well, I'll tell you, they were under U.S. command the whole way and the whole time. Uh, they never were doing something because the UN told them to do it. They were doing things because the chain of command going all the way up to Washington, uh, the Pentagon and the White House told them this is what we want you to do <clears throat> of a combat nature. And there weren't any disagreements between the U.S. policy and the policy coming out of the United Nations as to what to do about Somalia. They happened to be wrong. I said they were overly committed, they were idealistic, they were unrealistic, and the backlash has hit at the wrong time because it's joined a number of other forces in this country, and I think you all are aware of them. There's a natural predilection to say, well, America first uh, and foremost. Uh, today, we are far and away the superpower. No one can contest the United States militarily. We can take on the entire rest of the world and uh, win with one hand tied behind our back. Uh, so since our national security is not threatened, we don't have to worry about the rest of the world. Furthermore, we're the superpower, so we can tell the rest of the world what to do and expect that they will obey. 
all these things. Furthermore, we have problems at home. We need to put our resources here at home. We don't have resources to waste abroad, uh, particularly since our vital interests are not threatened. Uh, all these things have sort of come together. And then you have a problem in Congress of a number of the Republicans deciding this is a good time to pay back the Democrats. And in 1974, 76, 78, uh, <coughs> congressional elections, Democrats began to impose increasingly tight controls over the power of the executive branch, saying you must not do this, you must not do that. Uh, and then they began to say, this is what you want, we want you to do in great detail. Uh, you can't sell arms abroad without uh, the approval of the Congress. You can't uh, do this. You had the War Powers Act, a reaction to Vietnam. It's all understandable, but nevertheless, it just kept getting farther and farther out, more and more micromanagement. And the general Republican approach is to say, we want to stop micromanagement. Uh, and yet, if you look at the two foreign assistance bills, one in the House uh, and one in the Senate, they're loaded with details, saying uh, we, you must recognize Tibet as a state. Uh, any woman, this is my wife's area, Phyllis is the Assistant Secretary for Population, Refugees, and Migration. And uh, she's been in the middle of a number of fights. I sit on the sidelines and watch. But uh, <clears throat> one of the items in the bill says, here again, it's what happens when you're well motivated, but you don't really understand and you don't think through what you're doing. The provision of the bill says the United States must give political asylum to any woman who has a justified fear of forced sterilization or abortion. Well, Phyllis came home and said, uh, this is interesting because this means there are 200 million Chinese women who are going to be lining up for political asylum. <laughs> and are we really ready for that? Well, I don't think that uh, Representative Chris Smith uh, really had that in mind, but uh, that's what it means. Uh, because once this starts, you're not going to be able to stop it. It's very idealistic. It's, uh, it's wonderful from one point of view, but it's terribly unrealistic, which shows that the Republicans are just as easy as the Democrats when it comes to falling into these kind of things, of micromanaging and putting your own special hobby horse in there and doing it your way. And uh, in addition to that, uh, they're trying to put very tight controls over the power of the executive branch, much as the Democrats did after the Vietnam War with the War Powers Act and other things. People abroad are saying, well, who's in control in the United States, uh, the President or the Congress? Uh, we don't know who to deal with anymore. <clears throat> this is causing a problem. It's one that we have to look at very, very carefully, I think, and it's causing a lot of anguish in Washington. Uh, because if you look at the real world, you'll see that the United States, yes, is not threatened. We're the superpower. Yet we are probably more dependent upon the rest of the world than we have been in a hundred years. Since the Europeans became weaker and we became stronger, we no longer had to worry about European designs upon the United States or upon the Western Hemisphere. The Spanish, the British, uh, Germans, the French uh, all fell by the wayside. So we didn't have to worry about them in this part of the world. <clears throat> we could go our own way. But today, the economic interdependence of the United States has become quite pronounced. You think about it, exports and imports in the past 10 years have gone up each from 4% of our gross national product to 12% for tripling. Uh, most of the hundreds of thousands of jobs that have been or will be created in this decade are for exports. That's the current dynamic factor in the U.S. economy. We have to learn how to compete. On the other hand, uh, we're getting financing from abroad. The Japanese and others are buying our treasury bonds in order to cover our deficit habit. Uh, you look at the components for the high-tech machinery that's made in this country, whether it's automobiles or airplanes or computers or what have you, and the parts come from all over the world. If we weren't able to get them from abroad, uh, we wouldn't be able to produce the things we make that are so important for our civilian economy and for our military establishment. Because the components come, in many cases, from abroad. All of them are not made here in the United States for almost anything that we produce. So that's another way in which we're 
dependent. Uh, what happened to the stock markets in London, in Bonn, in Singapore, uh, as we've seen with Barings Bank, uh, can have a tremendous impact upon the stock market here. So we're in an, in an, an interdependent world. If we turn our back on it, we're the ones who are going to be hurt. Even though our security is not threatened in a military sense, we have to think about our relationships with the rest of the world. We also have to think about the long-term nature of the world and where we'd like to see it come out. When we're thinking about Bosnia, we have to remember that Sarajevo for the Europeans brings very clear memories of World War I. And so when we tell them what to do, we say, well, lift the embargo, do this, do that. There are no American troops on the ground. The French, the British, the Canadians are the ones who may be killed if uh, things go badly because of something we've suggested to be done. Uh, they don't take it very kindly. They say, who are you to tell us what to do from great distance when you're not even willing to be involved? When we say, the we is sort of general, uh, when someone prominent in the United States says, well, enlarge NATO, expand it, take in all the countries of Eastern Europe right up to the Russian border. The Russians have thought about NATO as an enemy for almost 50 years. They're not quite sure that it's not still going to be the enemy. They say, wait a minute. The Americans say, just do it. The Europeans say, well, now, wait a minute. We've had two massive wars in this century. Uh, they've been fought on our soil. They include the Russians, the Germans, the French. Uh, we'd like to proceed cautiously. And NATO has already agreed to take a year studying this matter and then see where they want to come out. We have something called the Partnership for Peace, uh, which includes all these countries and the Russians. That's not bad. Let's just, just take it easy. We say, no, no, we're in a hurry. We want you to do it this way. And they get upset. Our friends get upset. Uh, the Russians get upset. And we say, just do it our way. Well, this doesn't make any sense. The Russians are in the middle of a tremendous change. And some of us can think back to the difficulties we had in this country. And it wasn't easy. I mean, we have difficulties enough as it is now with our capitalist system, if you will. But the period of transition, uh, when we had robber barons and uh, revolutions and uh, of workers and things of that kind and uh, no real social safety net, were very, very tough on this country, the years of the Depression. And uh, someone said, I think, uh, to President Clinton when he was in Moscow, said, you know, the situation in this country is like it was during the Depression in the United States. And it took us quite a while to work through that. And it wasn't easy. We weren't quite sure we were going to get through it. And that's the situation they're in. They're moving in the right direction, but it's slowly. And it's not going to be easy for them. It's not going to be easy for the rest of us. But we need to be patient. This doesn't mean tolerating or accepting everything they do. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be anguished by Chechnya. But it means that we have to understand their limits as to what we can get and their limits as to what we can expect. And we have to be more careful in dealing with the rest of the world because we want to help it through. They want our leadership like never before. They're troubled by what's happening. Uh, yet they see us as very uncertain. They see the political fighting. They see the confusion within the administration. They see the fights between Congress and the administration as to who's in charge. They say, well, we're not getting any leadership from the United States. Furthermore, we're not getting any understanding. And if you want to have a trade war, okay, we're ready to fight. Uh, <clears throat> we thought you wanted cooperation with NAFTA and uh, GATT and the World Trade organization, but if you want to have a trade war, we're ready because our economies are moving faster than yours. So I think that all of us have got to be more tolerant of the way the world is changing. We have to understand the need to understand it better. We need to continue the network of relationships that we've had with other countries that we've set up over the last 50 years. Uh, things like the World Bank, the IMF, uh, the European Union, which we've encouraged, even though we're not a member of it, starting with the common market. Uh, <clears throat> the World Trade Organization, NAFTA, uh, OECD, all these things uh, on the economic side 
plus the web of private relationships has become stronger and stronger. All these need to be nourished. Uh, we need to be more aggressive and more understanding about how to deal with other countries economically, but we've got what it takes. If we just work harder to understanding it and uh, continue to do what we're doing and don't just suddenly turn away and say, we don't need any of these organizations anymore. They served us well for 50 years. They've enabled us to achieve a lot of things politically and economically, but just, just toss them out. We won't vote any money for them this year. Uh, instead of saying, let's understand how to use them better in terms of peacekeeping or same thing is true with organizations like uh, the OAS, uh, others of a political side, which we've used over the past 50 years. Collective security, if you will, is still a very important thing. We need to work with others. The Security Council was invaluable during the war in the Gulf. People tend to forget about that. Had the U.S.-led operation in the Gulf, Desert Shield and Desert Storm, not had the endorsement of the Security Council, achieved by a great deal of hard work by President Bush and Secretary of State Baker, bringing the Chinese and the Russians along, something we weren't sure was going to happen. But had this not happened that way, the Europeans would probably not have been with us. The other Arabs for sure would not have been with us. So we'd have been in a situation where we would not have had use of the military facilities in Saudi Arabia in order to protect the oil fields, which were terribly important to us, and even to protect them, but they would not have been able to go along with us had the Security Council not endorsed it. And so you'd have had, throughout the Arab world, an explosion of a political nature, very much like the one you had with the oil fields in Kuwait. The whole Arab world would have been burning because there would have been the infidels, the United States, coming in against the Muslims. The fact that we had a number of very strong Muslim countries with us was very, very important politically in making sure that we didn't have an explosion throughout the Muslim world, making sure that people understood this was clearly a response to an act of aggression. It was not Christians against Muslims, if you will. It was those who believe in peace against an aggressor. But we had to bring others along. This is very important. It was more important, frankly, than the fact that we ended up uh, financially in the black because they eventually paid us more than we actually spent. Uh, but that was important, too. So there is virtue in collective action, if you will. There are different ways to achieve it, but you shouldn't say, we don't need the United Nations anymore because we're so strong and powerful. Uh, we do. We don't need other countries. We can stop uh, at the water's edge and say, you do it our way or we'll write you off. Because the trends over the long term in China as well as in Russia are probably for progress in the right direction, but it's very difficult. And we, as I say, I repeat, for the Chinese as for the Russians, we can't accept everything they do. On the other hand, there are limits as to what we can get them to do to change along the lines we would like them to change using our own culture. Over time, what's happened already in China shows what's going to happen in the future. There's much more tolerance, there's much less control from Beijing than there used to be because the economy is changing. The same thing has happened in Thailand and Korea. Authoritarian governments that were run by the military and by those who they supported have given way to a great deal of democracy because the development of a middle class has made this absolutely unavoidable. And the same thing I suspect will take place over time with China. But if it doesn't, if they're pushed too hard, at this time when they're worrying about the succession of leadership, then you may find a country of a billion people that fragments. Can you imagine China looking like Somalia or Liberia? Uh, that would certainly not be good for the human rights of the Chinese people. It would not be good for the economy of China. It would not be good for those who are dealing commercially with the Chinese, including the United States. It would not be good for the security of the whole region. So one needs to be a little bit tolerant, a little bit patient in dealing with them. <clears throat> I would say with the Chinese and the Russians both, I would reapply the old Reagan theory of trust but verify. That is, let's not make them our enemies again, but, and let's not trust them totally, but let's try to work with them to keep them moving in the same direction, even though it's sort of a fitting, fits and starts uh, movement. And I think that we have to pay more attention to the Europeans and uh, we have to pay more attention to others 
in how we conduct our foreign policy. We can't simply say, you're going to do it our way. Thank you. Ambassador, we're going to, to yield to our tyrant, which okay. is, is time, and, uh, but we do thank you. It was awfully good of you to, to share your thinking with us, and I think that's been a, a marvelous education, and, uh, and the wisdom which is embodied within it. It's been a, a splendid and enjoyable and edifying evening. Thanks so much.